you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Now, I, uh, I had the, the joy and the privilege of being here for the first service, and, uh, and I have to say they were better movers than you guys. Um, but, but you're my kind of people. Uh, if you watch me trying to do the actions, you will understand. But uh, it's great to be with you today. Um, and uh, uh, so my name's Ricky. As you've heard, I'm the minister at, at Rayleigh Baptist. Um, I, I'm married to Tracy. We have a, a son, Isaac, who is 13 um, and enjoying all the joys of uh, being parent to a teenager. Uh, if any of you have any wisdom for me afterwards, I would love to hear it. Um, but uh, yeah, but, but life is good. Life is a joy. Um, even in its challenges, which is something of what we're going to be talking about today. Now, this is my first time at, uh, at Kingswood, um, and uh, I've, I've been here for meetings. I've come and, and met with Stu and other ministers here, but it's my first time here on a Sunday morning. Um, and I have to say that it's always nice to be invited back because that's a sign that you didn't do too badly the first time. But the first time you're invited, my, what a, what a tremendous act of faith that is on your part because you've got no idea what you're expecting today, have you? Um, but, but we're going to be reading from, uh, from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 today. Um, and I wanted to just set a little bit of context before I bring today's reading. Um, and this is, um, this is possibly written by Solomon. Um, and uh, I say possibly because you know what biblical scholars are like. They like to disagree with one another. There are some things where they say this is absolutely written by Paul um, or this is absolutely written by so-and-so. But but this is possibly written by Solomon. I'm going to go with that it was, because the majority of people seem to say so. Um, and there are, there are multiple interpretations. There are, uh, there are wonderful um, kind of nuances to what is said in this, this whole book. Um, there are statements of optimism. Some people would say there are statements of pessimism in here. Um, there's philosophical skepticism. These are the longest words I'm going to use today. Don't worry. Um, I don't like them either. Um, but there's also faithful belief in, in these words that we're going to read today. There are um, a number of contradictions within the book as well. Um, and, uh, and sometimes in this particular kind of book, it can be difficult to find one consistent message throughout. Um, and uh, uh, Stu mentioned um, earlier the, the wisdom genre and this is this is what this book is it's from it's the the, the wisdom genre of, uh, imparting wisdom and knowledge to us um, it's about teaching people to to fear the lord um, and um, uh, when i was coming to faith i devoured the book of proverbs absolutely love the book of proverbs um, uh, and this is in the same genre as proverbs so for me this feels like home um, I, i've got some slides i'm going to can I, there we go. I'll come to the reading in a minute. Can I have uh, slide number two, please? The title today is God and Time, um, but, uh, but our second slide, um, thank you. Uh, this, David Pawson um, wrote a, a fantastic book. It's about this thick uh, on the whole of the Bible, which I find really helpful because it's written in a way that I can understand, which is good. Uh, and he said this, Ecclesiastes is the strangest book of the Bible. It's the easiest to understand, but it says the most outrageous things. Okay, so can I invite you to, uh, to open your Bible if you have it, um, and, uh, and let's read together uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verses 1 to 15. Sorry, this is where I need my, need my glasses, even though I've got a large print Bible. Isn't that sad? It's entitled, A Time for Everything. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate a time for war, and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? 
I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. And God does it so that people will fear him. Whatever is, has already been. And whatever will be, has been before. And God will call the past to account. Amen. Amen. Now today's passage may be very familiar to some of us, may be very familiar to most of us. Um, And it's one of the most well-known passages of the Bible, probably thanks to the song by the birds, um, much before my time, 1965, give you an idea of uh, of where I sit in the uh, the age band. Um, And some people of a certain age may never have read Ecclesiastes, but would recognize those words, because there's a a faithful representation of those uh, those words in the lyrics of that song. Um, And I don't know whether you're like me, but when when I read something that I know well, when I read a passage that I know well, I have to pay even more attention because otherwise I just drift off and I think I know what the Lord is trying to say. Um, And I'll just just review and go over the words and it doesn't mean anything. And so it requires often some more study when you already know the passage. That's my experience. And I, I have I've probably been guilty of, uh, of misquoting some of this out of context in the past. But, but today, um, I want to, to give us the context. I want us to understand what it says, this chunk of Scripture in its entirety, and what does it say in this context. Um, and a spoiler alert, before we even begin, um, it's ultimately about God's sovereignty. It's about God's sovereignty. God rules over and above all things and all people. He has set all things in place and all things in motion and he remains above them all. And God, as as the sovereign king, God has the right to exercise his ruling power over all of creation still. And that includes you and me. It includes the planetary seasons, it includes chapters and seasons of life as well. So the title today is God and Time. And, uh, and God is outside of time. I'm not even going to go there today because that blows my mind thinking about it too much. But God is outside of time and we are bound by time. But God, uh, God our sovereign God, speaks the heavens and the earth into being. And he sets the time and the seasons in place. I can barely set the table unsupervised, and God sets all of creation in motion and in place. Um, but there are, there are three key themes from this passage that we're going to look at today. They are time, toil, and trust. Uh, I haven't made them up. They all appear in this scripture. I'm not, I'm not just going for the standard um, uh, alliteration here. But the first is time. Um, and we should have a slide for time. Thank you very much. Um, Uh, So verse 1, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And uh, and the first part of this this passage is a poem. Um, There is also, I've mentioned one song already, there's also a version that fits perfectly to the tune of of We Are Sailing, if you know that song. Some of you will uh, will know it, if you like that kind of thing. Um, But this, this poem in these opening verses, if you look at it, it covers the breadth of activities and human emotions, um, from beginning to end, and everything in between. In verses 2 and 3, it talks about our life and our work, the whole of our life, the beginning to the end. It talks about our work, it talks about planting and weeding. It talks about killing and healing, tearing down and building up. Verse 4 talks about emotions, There is a time to weep, and yet there is a time to laugh. 
There's a time for mourning and there is a time for dancing. It talks about our work and our relationships in verses 5 and 7. It says about scattering and gathering, about tearing and mending, about our work. It talks about our relationships, embracing and refraining from embracing, about silence and about speaking. Verse 6 talks about possessions and stuff, which we talked about a little bit in our our first uh, service this morning. It talks about the search for things and the time to give up searching for things. It talks about keeping certain things and letting go of others. It talks about our personal and our public relationships in verse 8. Our personal relationships, it talks about love and hate. Possibly that relates to our family and our friends at times. But then it refers to our public relationships. It talks about war and peace relating to tribes and to nations. So we see just in those first verses that the whole spectrum of life is covered. The good and the bad and everything in between. Um, If we can go to slide four, please. Uh, I found this wonderful uh, little quote in my study Bible as I was preparing for this week. Life is endlessly complex. Anybody agree with that? Oh, good. Excellent. I, I, yeah, that, that just struck me as truth. It's not scriptural. It was found in my study Bible, but it's not scriptural, but it's absolutely true. And that was said in the context of this passage. There is a time for everything, and yet life is incredibly complex, endlessly complex. There is a time for everything, everything under the heavens. Um, And I'm sure if we look back at those verses, we will recognize many of them. We will have been there ourselves. We could probably tick a number of those off our list. Yep, I've had that time, I've been in that time, I've known that, that season. Each one, the good and the bad, and has been ordained and appointed by God. Now I find that I find that challenging because when you think about the bad times, you think about those dry, tough seasons, even they have been appointed by God. And so we kind of come to our our second um, heading, which is toil. And the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, And uh, there are a couple of verses that refer to this. We're not going to spend much time on on toil um, because I want us to major on the final one, but um, there are a couple of verses re- which refer to our toil, about our, our human efforts in our relationships and in our work. In verse 9, it talks about a sense of frustration. What is there to be gained from our toil? You will know that if you've been in one of those tough seasons that just seems to stretch out before you, and you sit there and you wonder, what, what good is coming of this, Lord? How can you be working and moving in this? And that's what the writer is saying at this point. What good is there to be gained from our toil? And it's not just about frustration in that season. It's not even about boredom in that season for us. If you look into verse 10, it talks about there being a burden laid on us by God. And so in those tough times, in those times where you have to work that bit harder, It talks about there being a burden having been laid on us by God. Now, that seems unfair. But the language takes us back to the start of the Bible. If you flick all the way to the beginning of your Bible, um, Genesis chapter 3 and the story of Adam and Eve. I'm going to stick to Adam, otherwise I'll get accused of saying nasty things about women, and I don't say that. But it's talking about Adam. God refers to a punishment for Adam for his part in disobedience. And he says that you will now know painful toil as a result of your disobedience and your sin. And so I think there's there's something of that in what the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying. We're not going to have an easy ride in this life because of the fallen state of the world and the fallen state of us, everyone in it. But there is an element. we, We are not perfect. We are not yet perfect. And so we are going to struggle at times. And when life is tough, hopefully the seasonal nature of creation and life can be a comfort to us. Because however long we have been in this tough season, we can know this too will pass. 
that there is another season coming. There is a time to weep, but there is also a time to dance. There's a time to mourn and a time to laugh. So if you are in the mourning and the weeping, know that there is another time coming. This too shall pass. Life exists beyond our present moments and our present circumstances. And if you think of the darkest time in your life, the hardest season, the the most frustrating period of your time here on earth so far, I just want to remind you that you have come through it already. If you are here this morning and you can think back to a darker time than you are in now, then you have come through it already. And so, well done for your part in it. Congratulations for sticking through it. And if you are in your darkest season and still you are here, or you are watching online, then I'm in gold star to all of you. The fact that you are even here today shows that God is keeping you and God is strengthening you in the midst of a difficult season. Life exists beyond our present moments and our circumstances. But how can we hold on in those tough times? Because if you are sitting there thinking, I haven't faced those tough times yet, I've only ever had those good, those good things, I need to tell you the bad news, and that is that tough times are coming, because they will, for all of us. But how do we hold on in those tough times when they come? Well, that takes us to our final um, theme. Uh, you'll be pleased to hear, but don't be too pleased because it's a little bit longer than the other two. Um, and the final one is trust. Thank you. Um, even in the dark times, the difficult times, the frustrating times where we scream at the Lord, what good can come of this? We need to trust God in the midst of it. Verse 11 says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has made everything beautiful in its time. And even those tough seasons, God has ordained. God has appointed those seasons. And so if he has appointed them, we know that he's not going to abandon us in them. We can trust him in those moments. It goes on in that verse, verse 11, to say, he has also set eternity in the human heart. Even fallen man has some sense of something beyond this world, beyond the time that we live in, a longing within us for eternity that's promised to us, the eternal life that's given through Jesus. We, we have already in us a sense, a glimpse of what is to come. And so that sometimes is just enough to carry us through. Not always. But, but God has set eternity in the human heart. And yet, it says, in that same sentence, that same verse, yet, even though he has set eternity in our hearts, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Because he is sovereign. Because he is awesome. And I don't use that word awesome of anything other than stuff that God has done or is doing. God is awesome. He is sovereign, and because he is outside of time, and our tiny minds, my tiny mind, sorry, cannot grasp what that looks like, um, we c- I can't even begin to know. I, I can get what my beginning and what my end might look like, and that span in between. I cannot begin to grasp what the beginning and end looks like for the eternal king. I, I don't know. But there we are. Um, We can't fathom what he has done from beginning to end. I can't comprehend sometimes what he's done. I can't comprehend sometimes what he's doing. And I absolutely can't comprehend what he's going to do. No one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And you know what? It isn't ours to know. It's nice to be able to look back and say, and now I see what God was doing. Or in a moment to be able to say, ah, I have a sense that God is in this, even though I can't explain it. But it's not ours to know. Ours is to trust him. To trust him in it, whatever it 
may be for you at this moment, whatever it may be for you next week or in your next season, trust God. Trust God who wants to be near his people. Do you remember that from last week? Someone wise said that last week. Stood here in this very spot. Do you remember? I forced myself to watch last week's message. Oh, it was hard work. No, I'm, I'm joking. I wanted to see where you'd, where you'd come from before we got to today. But, but trust God who wants to be near his people. Trust that he's going to be there with you in the midst of whatever it is you are going through. He wants to be with you. He will be with you in every season and in every moment. He wants you to dwell with him, to choose to dwell with him in the mountaintop experiences and in the valley experiences. Even in your frustration, even in your pain, especially in your frustration and especially in your pain. Don't get up in the morning and think, life is too tough, I can't spend time with the Lord this morning. I think that's when we absolutely need to spend more time with the Lord, isn't it? He wants you to dwell with him in your frustration, in your pain, in your difficulty. He wants you to choose to hang out with him. Uh, Not like many of our earthly friends who are there in the good times and disappear in the bad times. He wants to be there in all of it. And he wants you to turn to him in all of it as well. In the tough times and in the dancing and in the rejoicing, but also in the weeping, and in the morning. Trust God in the midst of every season. And I have to, I'll be honest, it's, it's easier in the good seasons to trust God. It's really hard sometimes in the bad ones. Now, I, I don't know much about Kingswood Baptist Church. I mean, I feel I know you better this morning, which is great. Um, but I don't know much about you guys, but I'm, I'm sure that for most of you, that the news that Stuart and Adele and family were moving away was tough to take, tough to hear. And for many of you, will have come as a surprise and a shock. Now, let me tell you, God had been working on it long before that, so don't, it wasn't a surprise to him, but I, I appreciate how hard it can be for you to hear it and to process it. And how, why do I know that? Because I've been where you are. I was just saying to somebody this morning, I still remember, I can still vividly remember the day when my then pastor who I'd come to faith under, told the church he was leaving. Now, that's my first experience of a minister saying, I'm off now. Like, and you're, it feels like the floor has opened up. And you're like, whoa, what is going on? So I, so I know, I know how you feel. I know how hard it is to receive. I've been there as a church member. Um, I've also been there as a minister whose fellow minister says, God's calling me away. And that's equally hard. Um, So I was called to Rayleigh to join and make a team of four ministers. Um, And uh, for lots of reasons we won't go into this morning, um, by the time we got to lockdown, we were two ministers. And then halfway through lockdown, my fellow minister said, I'm going. And I'm like, what? (laughs) So I know how you feel. I absolutely know how you feel, both as as a church member, but I know as a minister as well. Um, and, I, and I want to say to you, um, as someone who sat in that seat and heard that during lockdown, uh, as I walked home that day, uh, not even, I mean, I knew where I was going. I was on autopilot walking home, um, but not even thinking about anything. And then I, I wouldn't say I heard God speak to me, but I felt God speak to me. And I want to say to you the things that he said to me that day, um, because I want them to be an encouragement to you. Um, and from that moment, I had peace. It's not been easy, but I had peace. And what he said to me, so the, the guy that was leaving us was called Jonathan. And, uh, and God said to me, if it's my will for Jonathan, which I had said earlier in the day, if it's my will for Jonathan, God said, then it's my will for Rayleigh Baptist Church and for you. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. And so I want to say that to you today. God hasn't said that to me to give to you. Um, But that has been an encouragement to me and and enabled a time of peace in the midst of turbulence. Uh, And I believe it to be true, and now I know it to be true, having worked through it. Um, So Stuart and Adele believe this is God's will for them. 
And if it is God's will for them, and if this other church, whoever they may be, no, I'm joking, uh, if this other church has called them, it's God's will for that church as well. And so it must also be God's will for you. So trust him in this season as well. It doesn't take away the challenges that you face. Um, and believe me, for those of you who are members, the challenges that are faced by your elders and trustees are even greater than the ones that you're facing. So pray for them and support them in this. It doesn't take away those challenges, but it, and it doesn't change anything practically, but it, that, that word to me made the world of difference in that season. And it has been one of the hardest seasons that I've been through, but, but God has been there throughout. And so let's, as we come into land, verses 12 and 13. 12 and 13 give us kind of a, a micro view of things. They're like the, the zoomed in view. It's like looking under a microscope. Okay, so we're looking at the petals of a flower or the insect on the petals of a flower. It's that kind of view. Okay, um, and it's often where we keep our focus on our day to day, on our specific circumstances and our time. And the writer says, I know that there is nothing better for people than for people to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find their satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. So each season, wherever you are at, each season is a gift when you find your satisfaction in it. When you accept, well, this is where I am, and I will do whatever I can to work in it and to change it, but this is where I am and I must be satisfied. I must trust in the Lord who has ordained it and I must find my satisfaction in it. When you trust that God is with you and that this too shall pass, you find your satisfaction in where you are in that season. Now, Events at my church over the last month and a half, we've had multiple deaths and funerals, um, we've had a number of terminal diagnoses, we've had people going into care, mental health crises, safeguarding issues, um, relational issues within the church and beyond the church just in the last month and a half. And if I keep my focus there, then I'm despairing. I can't do it. It's been a, it has been a diff difficult few months on the back of a difficult few years, and it would be really easy sometimes to just throw in the towel and say, you know what, I'm done, I can't, I can't do it, Lord, it's too much. I have to say, this month has started a little bit better. I know it's early in the month already, um, but Friday was a wedding, which was lovely, um, and tomorrow's holiday, yay! Um, so, so there's August looking good. I've also got a birthday in August as well, so that's great. So... Um, but it would be easy sometimes if I kept my focus on these bits, what's ahead of me, what's in the now, keep my focus zoomed in, then it would be easy to give up. And it would be harder to trust what God is doing. But when I zoom out a little bit and see glimpses of the bigger picture of what God is doing, wider than um, a wider view of rather than just some deaths and some terminal diagnoses, but look at broadly, what is God doing in the life of our church? Actually, then I can be encouraged. Then I can be encouraged. For one family, it may be a season of mourning and of weeping. But for the wider church and for the community, it is a season of laughing and dancing for lots of reasons. But I have to zoom out to see it. If I keep my head down and I sit at my desk and stay in the day-to-day, -day, I would be despairing. It's important to keep a right sense of perspective, but still it's easier said than done. But I think the next verses hopefully will help us, verses 14 and 15, because we go from the, the micro view, the zoomed in view, to the macro view, the zoomed out. So instead of, tele, uh, tele, instead of microscope, we go to telescope. So instead of looking at the insect on the petals of a flower, um, we're, we've got the, I don't know, 50,000 foot view of what's going on beneath us. Because it gets to talk about God's sovereignty. The writer um, says, I know that everything that God does will endure forever. God is eternal, and the things that he does will last for eternity. And he says that nothing can be added to what God does, and nothing can be taken away. Because God, the sovereign king, is perfectly sufficient in all things. There is nothing lacking in him. 
And the writer says that, that God does this so that people will fear him, not cower away from him in fear of how he's going to react, but because he is awesome. We are to have an, a, a reverence and awe about how amazing our God is. That's why he does some of these things. He does what he does so that people will fear him. If you read in, uh, in Proverbs um, chapter 9 and verse 10, it says that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We would be very wise to be in awe of our incredible sovereign God. The commentary that I was reading this week said that everything that is happening now is an unfolding of the plan that God made from before the foundations of the earth were laid. Nothing can be added. Nothing can be taken away. Now, I don't want to get into predestination this morning because we'll be here for... Goodness, I need to stop. Um, but we'll be here for longer. But um, I believe that we have free will to choose how we act. Absolutely. Absolutely but I also believe that God has factored that in already, that God knows what a muppet I'm going to be at times, and that's already part of his plan to respond. So let's not, let's not get there. He knows the choices I'm going to make and that you are going to make, the good, the bad, the wise, and the unwise. Um, and the, the next part of this verse goes on and says that whatever is has already been, and whatever will be has been before. Um, so I want us just to think about that the language of, uh, of seasons and cycles in life, not, not cycles as in bicycles, but the, cy the cyclical nature of, of life and time. So think about the days and the nights. Um, so what is, maybe we're in the middle of night time, what is has already been. We may be in the night time and we may be fearful because we're in the night time, but actually it's already been night time and we've survived it already, so we don't need to worry. We've no need to fear because we've experienced it already. And then what will be has been before. So morning is coming, but we don't need to fear the morning because we've already had a few mornings. We've already been there. And life goes on and round, doesn't it? Days and nights and weeks and months and seasons. Ecclesiastes verse, uh, uh, chapter 1 and verse 9 says, There is nothing new under the heavens. What has been will be. And what is will be again. There is nothing new under the heavens. The months and the seasons, they soon roll around again. It will soon be Christmas. Have you had your Christmas planning? No, you haven't, have you? Anybody else had a Christmas planning meeting yet? Yeah, we have ours in July, start of July. Oh, it will soon be Christmas. And then before, it, before we know it, it will be Easter again. And then it will be summer. And we'll be looking at Anyway, it comes again, doesn't it? Um, months and seasons planetary movements, generational changes. I'm sure some of you, dare I say, of the older generation will say, yeah, we've seen this before. We've been there. We've done it. We know what's going on. We expected this to happen. And whatever you are facing is not a surprise to God because not only has he seen it before, but he knew it was coming again. So whatever season you are in at the moment, however hard, however long it has been, I want to encourage you, implore you to trust him again. To trust him again today because he is faithful, he is loving, he is just, and he always was and he always will be because he's unchanging. Oh, and he's also the sovereign ruler of all creation. Just in case that adds a little tick to the box for you. And so... To conclude, um, can I have slide seven, please? Great. So again, this same writer, David Pawson, he says, when we believe that our lives are in God's hands and that he knows the right time for us to dance and to weep, then we see things which happen to us are not by chance, but part of God's choice for us. He is weaving a pattern of our lives. So if we can have verse... Uh, Verse, slide eight. So two things I wanted just to highlight. That there is a right time. God knows the right time for us to weep. Because there is a right time for us to weep. He knows the right time for us to mourn. There is also a time for us to laugh 
and to dance. There is a right time to tear down and to build up. There's a right time to speak and to be silent. A right time for a beginning and an end. And the second point is that it is God's choice for us. God has ordained it. God has appointed it. He is, through it, he is weaving a pattern for our lives. So trust in God. Trust in God in all things. Don't trust in people. I mean, don't put all your trust in people. You do need to trust people, but don't don't trust man. Trust God. Don't trust emotions. Think back to that long list at the beginning um, of, uh, of life and work and emotions and things. Don't trust emotions. Trust God. Pay attention to your emotions, but trust God in the midst of them. Don't trust your possessions, whatever you do, however flash they might be, however hard you've worked for them, however long it's taken you to get them. Don't trust your possessions. Trust the all-sufficient God who will provide. Because God is sovereign. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. And he is unchangeable. He sets the times and the seasons for all of us. And there is often toil for us in the middle of it. And yet, I want to encourage you to trust him in all things. I'm going to invite the band to uh, to come and to join us. And uh, I want us to use this next song as a time of response. We're we're going to pray. I'm going to pray over you um, just before we sing. Um, But I want to use this as a time of response between you and God. No one's necessarily going to ask you uh, what was going on this morning, what was God saying to you, or what were you saying to God. But I want you to ask yourself, what, what time or season is it for you? What time or season is it for you? For you personally? Uh, for your family? What time and season is it for you as Kingswood Baptist Church? And what do you think God might be trying to weave through the things that you are going through at the moment? What might God be trying to bring out of the things that you're going through at the moment? Actually, there's one more slide. Isn't that, isn't that always the way? I'm coming to the end, but not quite. Um, so there's another slide, and it's another quote from, I'm sorry, thank you at the back for doing a cracking job today. Um, so there's another quote from David Pawson. Let me, let me read it. He says, Our free will, our free will, never overrides God's will because God will be at work in all things to achieve his purposes. He chooses, uh, sorry, he calls us to choose his way, to surrender our wills to his sovereign control. And we are both accountable and responsible for the lives that we live. So wherever you are this morning, whatever when I say to you what season are you in and what time are you in, wherever you are this morning, you still have a choice about how you respond to it. And I want to encourage you to do two things. First of all is to, is to acknowledge that season that you're in. It's no good pretending. If, if you are in a really tough season, it's no good you sitting there going, yeah, it's probably all right. Yeah, a little bit of laughter sometimes. Just acknowledge the difficulty of the season that you're in if that's where you're at. Or maybe it is a time to dance and then don't sit on your hands if that's the case. Then acknowledge where you're at. Actually, this is a season to be laughing and dancing and celebrating. So acknowledge the time and the season that you're in and then acknowledge that whatever that time or season is, that God is still sovereign in the midst of it. Let's pray. 